In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Listen now for a word from God. Barb, is this okay? Put it higher? No, I can't help that. (laughs) All right. All right. Okay. All right. Listen now. We must no longer be children, tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness in deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, We must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The question we have before us today is, what does it mean to be the church? And the answer that we're going to think about today comes from our book of confessions. Today it is the theological declaration of Barman that we are thinking about and using liturgy from. That's why there were so many hard words in it. In... 1932, on June 6th, the German Evangelical Church was formed. Now, the church had existed in Germany for a long time. It was mostly Protestant and mostly Lutheran. But on June 6th, 1932, the government gave the church a new constitution. And that constitution, in the constitution, they championed the need for racial purity, asserted the racial superiority of the German people, and prosecuted a fierce opposition to Marxists, Jews, and all others. And then, the following January, Adolf Hitler was elected the Reich Chancellor in Germany. Not long after that, the Aryan Paragraph, was released by the Nazi government, which, among other things, made it illegal for any person of Jewish descent to serve in civil service, and made it illegal for anyone who was of Jewish descent to be a member of the German Evangelical Church, making race, whatever race may mean, a qualification for joining the church. With that increasing pressure to follow the Nazi beliefs and to have the church governed by the state, the confessing church was formed. The confessing church were those groups of people who said, wait a minute, Jesus Christ is the head of the church. We are the body. The state cannot be made equal to Jesus and oversee the church. That doesn't work. That is not what we are about. And so the confessing church was born, and pastors and members would gather and have meetings and figure out, what are we going to do? How do we bring our neighbors and our friends from this German evangelical church back into the realm of where they should be. When I was in seminary, a professor talked about the the playground that we could play in. He talked about it like a sandbox and said, there is a big border around the outside of your sandbox, and you can play anywhere you want in that sandbox of Reformed theology. You can play near the edges over here, or near the edges clear over here. But to be reformed, you've got to stay inside this sandbox. And if you go outside the border, either you're not reformed, or you need someone to pull you back in. 
the confessing church said, this is our sandbox, and you guys have crossed that line. Come on back and play with us where Scripture leads us to be. The confessing church said, we are bound together by the confession of the one Lord of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. The declaration states that Jesus Christ is the one word of God. Jesus is God's assurance of forgiveness and Lord of our whole life. As the church of pardoned sinners, it has to testify in the midst of a sinful world with its faith as with its obedience that it is solely Christ's property and that it lives and wants to live solely from his comfort and from his direction. So the Barman Declaration happened when, in May of 1934, about 130 different pastors of these confessing church congregations gathered in Barman in Germany. They met for a couple of days, and what came out was this statement. The first thing it did was say, this is who we are. We are Reformed theologians in the path of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only Lord of the church. There is no area of our life where Jesus is not Lord. There is no area where the state can tell us what to believe or what to do. And then they rejected false doctrines. And that language is in there. I love it. It says, and we reject the false doctrine that... And the things they rejected were that no human being or institution can usurp the place of the living God. They reject where'd it go? They reject the false doctrine. Oh, well, I lost it. Oh, there it is. Oh that the church can become an organ of the state. Basically, they were saying, hold on, there's only one Lord, and it is not the state. That's the thrust of the document. But the point is that they're drawing their line in the sand and saying, this is who we are. And so we have to do these hard things in order to tell you, big church with all the power endorsed by the state, that you have lost your way. Because it is hard to be the church. When I started by saying, what does it mean to be church, to do church together, it means making hard decisions. It means knowing who you are and then following through with that. It might seem from our privileged view almost 100 years later uh, that what they did makes perfect sense and it was easy to do. But the leaders of this confessing church ended up, Martin Niemöller ended up as Hitler's personal prisoner for years. He ended up in Dachau. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer ended up martyred for the confessing church and his faith. Uh, It wasn't an easy path. They stood up for what they knew was right and couldn't do anything else. They drew their line in the sand. And so it got me thinking about our line in the sand. Because each of us as individuals has our own lines in the sand that we will not cross. For some of us, it's the unequal distribution of wealth in this country that prods us to go and stand with others and protest that unequal distribution. For others, it's people who don't have a home, don't have a safe place to live, that prods us into being active to help create a space where they can have a house and learn skills so that they will be able to function safely and happily in society. For others of us, the line in the sand is hunger. Because in our wealthy country, there's no reason that people should be going hungry. 
For still others, that line in the sand is kids being taken away from their families. We all have our lines in the sand that prod us individually. But then as a congregation, we have lines in the sand as well. This congregation, although it's sometimes hard to name them, knows who we are and where we draw those lines. There's not much as a group you all won't do to support children and youth. There's not a whole lot of community activities that you would say, oh, no, we don't want to do that. You are a part of this community, and you are dedicated to the children and the youth. That's just a piece of our identity. But where we draw those lines in the sand, that is who we are. That's who we become. And so the next question grows from that. What do we need in order to live into our identity. What do we need? The confessing church needed the German evangelical church to realize what they were doing. What do we need to do God's business, knowing our identity and who we are? After worship today, we will have a congregational meeting for members, 18 and up, of the corporation of this congregation And we will be asking ourselves, do we need a building? Do we need this space to do the ministry to which we have been called? Do our lines in the sand require us to have a space? It's not an easy question. It's not an easy decision. It's just like for those theologians in Nazi Germany that had to stand up for what they believed. It could be that your person sitting beside you thinks something different. That's okay in this case. But where our lines are, that tells us who we are and helps us to decide what do we need and what do we do. Barman's legacy has been to remind Christian believers that no human being or institution can usurp the place of the living God. Hence, whether the integrity of either its doctrinal theology or its ethical and political witness is at stake, the church must take a stand. In the freedom of the gospel, the church must confess its faith in Jesus Christ and do so against all odds and no matter what the cost. We know our lines in the sand. We know who we are. And though our decisions that we make today don't affect the lives of millions of Jews or Marxists or anyone else that wasn't pure like they did in Germany in the 1930s, it's important to us. And it's important that we take a stand based on our identity. We are not a building. We are a body of Christ, working in the community, working for the children. We are not the building, but we may very well need the building. Think about who we are and whose we are. That is our call. Amen.